Great. Um, okay, we're going to be talking about intermediate Drupal front-end development. I just picked my head up, big crowd, hello. <laughs> um, I just uh, wanted to say, I don't know who they told you was going to be here, but it's just us. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell it's her first talk? I, I can't. She's a natural. Um, go ahead. Her first DrupalCon talk. Yes, this is my first DrupalCon talk, so please bear with me. I appreciate your patience. My name is Nagat Ahmed, and I've been a Drupal developer since Drupal 7. I'm an Acquia certified front end specialist and a graduate of Debug Academy's career changing Drupal course. <laughs> um, I'm currently a full time Drupal developer for enterprise projects. And <clears throat> my name is Ashraf. Um, I started Debug Academy around 10 years ago. Um, worked as an architect at Acquia for a bit. Um, <clears throat> I have all these, look silly how many there are, but the Acquia certification badges, um, they're all there. Um, I've gotten them so many times because of the Acquia certification courses that we created. So if you're interested in becoming Acquia certified, get in touch, we've got courses on that. I know that's not what you're here for today. Today we are going to make this screen a little bit bigger if it all works and get started with the intermediate front end talk. So the first topic that we will be covering today is on render arrays. Um, love them or hate them, they're part of Drupal so we might as well make the best of them. So what are render arrays? Render arrays are PHP arrays which contain all of the data that are, that's needed for the display as well as how the data will be displayed. The arrays are rendered into HTML later on. Um, so here are some render element examples. The markup property renders the value as standard HTML. Um, so as you can see there on the screen, uh, it has the paragraph HTML tags with the words hello, but what you see is hello. <laughs> um, the plain text sanitizes the HTML so the P tags show up to the end user. And the third example here has multiple properties. The type is checkbox, title is I accept, and you can see how it looks like right there. Um, so why should we use uh, render arrays? Well, the alternative to render arrays would be writing the HTML up front. That would be difficult to maintain. And um, <coughs> you know, there's a number of ways that front end uh, code could be processed, but uh, render arrays, as, as much as they leave a bad taste in many people's mouths, um, they do have a lot of benefits. Um, the fact that the information is stored in the arrays in the way that it is, the data and the uh, display information and more is all kept separate, uh, enables some performance gains. Um, so Drupal is able to consolidate some of the rendering information. For example, if two different elements require the same CSS, um, because you're loading them through this render array pipeline, Drupal will not load that CSS twice. It'll realize these elements appear on the same page, they both need the same CSS, let's only load that CSS once. And um, <coughs> again, keeping information in the render array format uh, enables Drupal to do things like um, integrate the twig code later, determine which twig file is best um, for any piece of data, um, and manage data and more um, in a more efficient way. Um, so uh, next we'll be talking about format and structure of render arrays. Render arrays you know, are known as the arrays of doom um, because they're made up of many, many smaller arrays nested many, many layers deep. The arrays consi keys consist of two parts. The properties, which begin with a hashtag or a pound sign, which is the data and how it should be displayed, as well as organizing entries, which make it easier for the developer to understand the render arrays. Render arrays are everywhere. Developers create smaller render arrays, and Drupal gathers the render arrays before turning them into HTML and such. 
this picture you can see here, um, we actually put a breakpoint, if you're familiar, a debugging breakpoint to pause the page mid-execution, mid-load, and look at the render array before it gets converted or before it gets rendered into HTML and more. And you can see here, we're at the, again, outermost uh, render element, the HTML element, and it has um, various pieces and layers to it, page, page top, page bottom, and more. And as she mentioned earlier, uh, render arrays tend to consist of um, properties which begin with pound signs and uh, sort of organizing entries. So here you can see um, a property of type HTML, which uh, amongst other things tells Drupal which twig file to load. Um, and then you have these organizing entries, page, page top, page bottom, which contain render arrays of their own. And uh, again, like she said, these can be nested uh, very deeply. So creating render arrays. Each render array typically starts with one of these. Markup, which prints the string as HTML, plain text, which prints the string as plain text, and type, loads the requested element from Drupal, and some examples of this are text field, table, form. Um, the theme, uh, the, yeah, the theme loads the requested twig file from modules. So where do we find the render array types that we can use? Um, here we have a linked page that includes a list of all of the render elements that come with Drupal core. Um, uh, to view an elements example, uh, you, you'll find it on this page. And uh, just a quick warning, sometimes the, the default value is documented when the correct property name is actually value. Yep, we wasted a lot of hours on that one. The documentation sometimes says default value equal to something and then you find out that that's actually wrong, the documentation is wrong, um, and it's not only on one element, it's multiple. Um, I should probably create an issue on drupal.org so they can <laughs> fix it. <laughs> but I'm telling you all instead, maybe one of you will do it. Um, so we're gonna talk a bit about how to get the most out of Twig with, you know, Twig's integration with Drupal. Um, so first of all, when you create content types, media types, block types, really any entity type, um, they all have view modes, right? So you'll probably see it the most with content types. You've got the, the default view mode, sometimes you enable the full view mode, the teaser, and you can create additional view modes or display modes. Um, and on those pages, uh, you can configure the output for each field, right? So you can go to an image field and you can say, I want this to actually just display as text, as a URL to the image, or I want it to display with the following image style. Now, again, this is something that we, you know, learn early on in our theming journey, um, that we can configure the field's output there. But um, did you know, um, when, when you change values on the Manage Display page, what you're actually doing is you are changing the content variable inside of the corresponding twig file. So this is actually a really powerful piece of information. Um, I think a lot of us encounter it and make use of it, um, but it's good to have you know, clear one-to-one -one relationship understanding between the two. So if you want to customize the output of your node in a twig file, um, you can start with um, going to that manage display, configuring the fields however you like, and r again, realizing or recognizing that every change you make on manage display directly um, affects the content variable of the corresponding twig file. So for content types, that's node.html.twig or any of the variants, node dash dash teaser, node dash dash page, um, et cetera. And for media, you're gonna have media.html.twig. This applies to all of those entity types. Um, so if you wanted to take control of your twig file, it doesn't mean you have to forfeit the benefits of the manage display interface. You should go to manage display, configure the fields output, configure what the fields should output, and then you should come to your twig file and realize, all right, I configured field heading. Um, I can write content.field heading, and it will output the fields rendered according to those settings from manage display. Um, so normally these files, node.html.twig and such, will render the content variable, the whole content variable all at once. 
Uh, but you don't have to do that. You can, render, you can render field by field, and you can still get those benefits of configuring the output on managed display. And to take it one step further, instead of just content dot fields machine name, you can append dot zero after the field name to remove or strip out the wrapper for that field. So you still get the formatted field from managed display. You just remove the outermost wrapper so you're not cluttering the markup. Um, sometimes there is a trade-off there. You might lose things like the inline editing if you have that module installed and enabled, um, but it will make the markup lighter. There are a lot of properties on variables and sometimes you don't know what properties are available. So for example, that content variable, there are ways to check, you know, it uses the machine names of the fields. Uh, but if you didn't know that and you wanted to find out what properties does the content variable actually contain, you can use the dump function in a twig file followed by the name of the variable. Now that would actually print out the variable in its entirety and sometimes that's too much. Printing out the whole content variable using dump uh, might be too much. It might print out too much information. It might cause the page to slow down or crash. Um, so sometimes you really just want to find out what the keys are or what the properties are. And that uh, can be discovered using this filter, pipe keys. So you can use dump, the name of the variable you'd like to investigate, and then this filter, pipe keys and that will output only the keys from that variable. So that's a way to see what properties are associated with this variable. And if you were to do that, it would not be a very user-friendly output. So take it one more step and add the HTML pre-tag, which stands for pre-formatted. What that does is it makes sure your browser does not swallow all the white space. It doesn't remove all the you know spacing um, in the output, um, and it ends up being a much easier to read output and list of variables. So all twig files have variables, but how do you know what variables are in a twig file? There's a special variable named underscore context. It has all of the file's variables as properties. To see a list of all variables in any twig file, write the code shown here. Uh, so there's the pre-tag and um, dump uh, underscore context with the pipe, keys, and then the closing pre-tag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really nice trick. This is actually not really a Drupal feature. That underscore context is part of Twig. It's available in every single Twig file. So you can put this line exactly as it's written. You don't need to customize it, and you will see all of the variables, just the variable names listed um, as part of the page output. Okay. Now, if you are taking this approach of customizing your Twig files, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, instead of rendering the whole content variable, you might be doing content dot field name um, or content dot field name dot zero. Um, you do need to be aware of some. Uh, some you know, pitfalls that people typically run into. Um, so whenever you overwrite any of the entity display files, be sure to maintain a wrapper, um, not the musical kind, like a div or an article um, with attributes, the attributes variable. So the node file, media file, they all have that attributes variable. You want to print it out on the wrapper of the um, entity that you're printing out. You also want to maintain title prefix and title suffix. Um, and from that point forward, you can do what you want. You can add the output you want. The reason it's important to maintain those variables is because they output information that Drupal relies on for interactivity and for outputting things like the contextual links. So sometimes you hover your mouse over a node or over a teaser and you'll see a gear icon appear and you click on it and you can press edit or configure. If you do not print out the attributes, title prefix and title suffix, you're gonna lose that gear icon. Um, also, sometimes you don't even notice that something broke. 
uh, until you place the block with Layout Builder and you realize it placed just fine, but I can't drag and drop it. So that's why you want to make sure to render those variables. Um, so additionally, so it's those three variables, and you also want the content variable to be rendered. So why do we need to render content? Right, we were talking about um, rendering fields within content as opposed to what Drupal does by default or themes do by default. They normally render the whole content variable. So why do you need to render the content variable? Uh, it's because content, that variable contains the fields on managed display as I mentioned earlier, um, but it also contains other information that we might not even think about. It contains caching information, um, it can contain information about the libraries, CSS and JavaScript and such. Um, so if you don't print out the content variable, you might break the caching. So you have two choices um, to print out the content variable, assuming you're taking this approach of printing out fields one by one. Um, so one choice is you can print out the content variable um, and to ensure you don't accidentally print fields out twice, you can add the without filter. So content without the fields you've already rendered. So if you already rendered the body field manually by writing content.body and the image field by writing content.fieldImage, you should still render the content field by, or the content variable I should say, by writing content without body field image. So it ensures you get everything you need and you don't get anything duplicated. A different approach, because sometimes you might have a content type with 30 fields and you might be rendering all of them and now you don't want to write content without 30 fields. Um, you can, uh, this is a bit of, I would say a hack, but it's, it's part of an active conversation within an issue in Drupal core talking about what is the best practice um, for this. And what you can do, you can create a variable in the twig file and set it equal to that content variable placed through the render filter. And putting it through the render filter triggers the cache bubbling, the CSS loading, all that good stuff. So it gives you everything you need without actually outputting anything from the content variable. So a bit of a workaround, you have to do one or the other. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about twig reuse and inheritance. Um, to get the most out of twig, um, in some cases you'll want to write your twig code um, and basically reuse it and load it in other files. There's a few ways to do that. One of them is include. You can use include to load code from a twig file into your current twig file. Um, so it's sort of like effectively copy pasting or inheriting code from another file. Include is the simplest of the three inheritance techniques that Twig provides. There's something called Twig blocks, which have nothing to do with Drupal blocks. It's just coincidental naming. Um, but a Twig block, I like to think of it as a way to name a portion of the Twig file and that's it. You're just giving a name, it's not doing anything else. You can think of it that simply. Um, so in this example, we have a header file and we're, we're naming this part logo. Block logo, so we're naming this logo. And here it says block menu, so we're naming this menu. So why would you name some of the code in your file? The reason is there are other inheritance techniques in Twig. Um, one of them is embed. Embed works like include. You get to copy the code from a file into your current file. But it has the added feature of being able to swap out any of the named Twig blocks. So if you're inheriting code from header.html.twig and if header.html.twig has a Twig block named menu, you can overwrite that portion of its code. So you can inherit all the code from header.html.twig, except sort of surgically replace just the part named block menu. 
If it has multiple named blocks, you can replace multiple named blocks. Um, and if you don't want to replace any, just don't write anything in, in between the embed and end embed, and it will inherit the code just the same way that include does. Okay. There is one more inheritance technique, extends. It's the same as embed. The, the difference is that you cannot write additional markup outside of those blocks that you're replacing. So it's like embed with an additional restriction. Um, I don't see, uh, Drupal core actually does use extends. Um, you, you, you might use this to ensure consistency uh, between the file structure. Um, you know, if you want to, if you have block.html.twig and you also have block dash dash site name dot html dot twig and you want to make sure that they both have the same structure, the same outermost wrapper, you can use extend to inherit from one to the other. Um, and the file that's using extends will not have permission to write an additional wrapper outside of what's being extended. Extend means inherit with the power to replace twig blocks. Um, with the, uh, one of the techniques I wanted to talk about here is, um, sorry, I just wanted to check the time. <laughs> 432, nice. Mm -hmm. How long is the talk? Okay. Um, okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to talk about, um, the strategy of decoupling Twig and Drupal. And when I say decoupling, I don't mean the exciting decoupling. I don't mean fully decoupled JavaScript's front end. Um, I'm talking about Twig and Drupal. Um, this is a technique that a lot of people use to increase the productivity of everyone on their team, including people who maybe have less Drupal experience, but plenty of CSS or theming front end development experience in general. Bless you. Um, so with this approach, let's say you needed to create a block, you need to style, or let's say a content type. You need to create a content type and style the teaser for that content type. Um, some teams might just assign that to one developer and say, you know, create this content type with this following teaser. Well, if you divide your tasks in this way, um, you can basically create a styling task for one developer to just write the twig and the sass for the teaser and not worry about the content type or you know, printing out the fields. They just create a component, you could call it, um, with this twig and the sass and maybe a JavaScript. Another developer would do the content type side of things. They might create the display mode, they might you know, put all the fields and so on. And then finally, the third piece of the puzzle is what we refer to as theming, which is where you take the content type and you take the styled component and you basically put them together. And you can put them together using embed, include, or extend, like we were talking about earlier. You can take the code that was written, the styling code, bring it to inherit it in node.html.twig and integrate the um, back end and the front end essentially. So again, the benefit of doing this is now your front end developers who don't yet know Drupal um, can get straight to writing the twig and the CSS and JavaScript. They can knock out all of the components um, they like and uh, the other team members who are more comfortable with Drupal can uh, integrate and you basically make sure everybody's productive earlier. Um, a new feature as of Drupal 10.1 that makes that approach a bit easier is uh, single directory components, uh, also referred to as SDC for short. Um, this is a module. Again, it's um, been included as of Drupal 10.1. You can enable the module. You would have to enable the module to use this feature. But the idea is you create a folder named components. So you're not putting this twig in the templates folder. Instead, you create a folder named components, and um, I think some of the words are cut off. Um, and you 
um, in, in that folder, you put your Twig and your CSS and your JavaScript for a specific component. So it might be a teaser or a card display or whatever you like. Um, but you sort of think of this as the styling piece of the puzzle, right? It's not yet really integrated with Drupal. You're just doing the styling portion first. And we saw include and embed and extends earlier. The way those work is they use a path to the file. Um, single directory components make it a little bit easier. You can write the name of the theme, a colon, and the name of the component. So you don't have to write slash components, slash folder name, slash file name. It makes it a little easier to write that path for inclusion. Okay, so to do this, you can enable the single directory components module. This is an example. You can create the accordion component uh, by creating a folder in there. Um, and that will require at least two files, a .component.yml file, which includes the schema or the definition for your twig code. And then you also have a twig file, which contains the twig code. Um, if you'd like to include CSS that just loads with this component, you would also create accordion.css. If you want JavaScript, you would also create accordion.js. And Drupal automatically loads these. So that's another feature. You don't have to mess around with libraries. Um, Drupal will auto load the CSS and the JavaScript. So this is also um, made to make developers who maybe don't have as much Drupal experience uh, more productive earlier with less of a learning curve. There is debugacademy.com slash USWDS, which has this uh, code sample for the accordion component. You can see the YAML file here. Uh, in that YAML file, you specify which variables the component has um, for integration with other Drupal modules. So if you create a component using single directory components, um, it might look like this. The, the usage of the component might look like this. Um, inside of your node dash dash teaser file, uh, you can embed your single directory component. You can use the with keyword to pass values into the component. So you can take the label variable from your node teaser file. You could pass it into the title variable from that single directory component twig file. So that's how you get to create these files as sort of standalone files that just have placeholder variables without the Drupal integration yet. And then here is where you integrate with Drupal more deeply. This is where you pass the Drupal values in to those components. So you can pass in variables like this and you can replace any twig blocks that the component might have as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about caching. Um, and the idea with caching is that uh, Drupal or the application stores um, already rendered or already loaded information um, so that it can load more quickly the next time around. So it doesn't have to be rebuilt. Because um, as she was talking about with render arrays, um, Drupal has these render arrays with information on what should load and where it should load and then it has to actually render them. That's a lot of work. Um, so once it's done it once, um, it's, uh, we cache it so it doesn't have to do it again. Um, so in, with the cache, um, there are three properties that we typically, you could say, are responsible for or um, focus on. Um, there's cache tags, which are used to determine, or I should say, to trigger cache invalidation. So for example, um, if you have the home page cached, that means you basically have a snapshot of the home page saved so that it can load more quickly next time someone visits. But eventually the home page does have to reload. You can't always load it from the cache, right? So on Debug Academy's home page, we have upcoming courses. But when we publish a different course, the home page needs to be rebuilt. We want the new course to show up. Um, so cache tags allow you to proactively clear the cache on any page associated with 
the specific tags. Cache contexts let you set uh, the uniqueness of the cache. So for example, if you have no cache context, that means the, cache, the cached copy of this page is good for everyone. Everyone who visits this page can use that same cache. If you have a cache context of user, on the other hand, you're saying this cache is only good per user. If, if the same user visits again, give them the cache. But if a different user visits, I want you to rebuild the page and give them their own version of the cache. That would be something like a block that says welcome Nagats. If it says welcome Nagats and she visits, and then she visits again, um, it can reuse the cache for her. But then if I visit, we don't want it to say welcome Nagats for me. So this block would need a cache context of user to say it needs to render differently for each user. There are other solutions to this, but that's the idea with cache context. And finally, max age says how long is the cache good for? If you have a max age of one day, then one day later it needs to be rebuilt. It will not give the cache copy um, after one day. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn. Um, so where do we write the caching information? In the render arrays. We create a property named hashtag cache and put the context tags and max age under it. So parent containers inherit the cache tags, context, and max age properties from their children. It's referred to as cache bubbling. So whenever the cache of a child expires, the cache of the parents expire as well. And that whole cache bubbling, it's one of the more complicated parts of Drupal, but it kind of just works until we break it. Uh, and <clears throat> it's really actually one of the highlights of Drupal is the fact that it has support for that. Um, but um, yeah, we've got, uh, debugging is one of the more tricky things. And I think this slide's probably one of the bigger takeaways from the talk. Um, it, was, it was new to me uh, when I looked it up and it's, really been a game changer. Um. So yeah, so in services.yaml, you'll enable um, parameters.render.config.debug to be true, um, which exposes the cache information in the pages markup. And looking at these two pictures here, um, th these are actually in the markup right after each other. I put them side by side, but in reality, they're right on top of each other. Um, but I put them side by side for two reasons. One, they didn't fit on top of each other in a visually pleasing way. Um, but two, to draw a comparison. Um, so you can see this says pre-bubbling cache tags. And the right side says cache tags. Now these are, the, all of this information is on one element. It's on the output of a view on a specific row. And when it says pre-bubbling cache tags, media view, media one, what that means is this element, this view row, initially um, has a cache tag of media view and media one. So that means anytime media one gets updated, the cache on this row is going to expire. Or anytime media view, so I guess the view itself, anytime that view is edited, the cache will expire for this. And it says pre-bubbling, so it's saying it has these cache tags just by itself, even if there were nothing being rendered inside of it. The part that immediately follows that is cache tags. So this is the cache tags all-inclusive, in, all the cache tags of the row itself as well as the cache tags from its children that bubbled up to it. So this element now has media view and media one because it always retains the originals and it has the cache tags from whatever is nested beneath it. So taxonomy term two. So something in that view depends on, tax, on the taxonomy term with ID of two. There's also config image style medium. So in that view, we must be using the image style named medium. So if someone were to go change that image style, that would trigger cache invalidation. It would clear the cache of this row of the view. So that's how granular Drupal is and file two, so there's a file with ID of two. If someone were to edit that file or delete it, then the cache of this row of the view would be cleared. And again, because this cache bubbles, um, it's not only this row of the view, the view itself, 
would bubble, uh, or I should say would have these same cache tags and would be cleared. And I don't know how helpful the captions are, but um, <laughs> the, the view itself would have its cache cleared and the page that the view appears on would also have its cache cleared. So again, this is one of the stronger features of Drupal and this is why you need to do things like render the content variable because the cache tags bubble and you don't want to break one of those bigger uh, selling points of Drupal. Okay. So that's what we aim to get through. So if you're interested in learning more, we are Debug Academy. We have various courses. We teach Acquia certification prep. Um, so if you're interested in getting the front end certification or back end certification, we have courses on that. If you're already a seasoned Drupal developer or mid-level, we have architect level courses and advanced module development courses. Um, and if you or a family member wants to become a Drupal developer, we have a part-time three-month course um, in which we teach a lot of what we were going over today um, and we build a website and a full theme and, and more. Um, and yeah, we also do custom training and all that good stuff. Um, and and if anyone wants, we can do a quick selfie before everyone leaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. And if, well, that got a lot smaller when I moved it. Uh, let's see. I had a QR code. There we go. If you'd like us to email you a code sample um, demonstrating some of what we were talking about today, you can go to that QR code or debugacademy.com slash DrupalCon 2024 and just check the box that says I want the code sample. There are some other check boxes if you want to hear about courses and whatnot, that's fine too, I won't be upset. Um, and yeah, thank you all. And we, I think we have time for questions, I believe. Um, so if there are any questions, please um, feel free. Um, yes, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Can the caching be applied to PDFs? Great question. Um, cache tags and contacts and such, in my experience, um, it's not as effective because browsers cache the files as well. Um, I just dealt with this within the past month too, so I should have the answer, but it was something we were struggling to figure out. Drupal handles the file caching by changing the file name. So when you upload a new version of a file, that's usually when the cache should be cleared on that file. So Drupal typically changes the file name. Um, it also might add a cache buster, so it adds like question mark and then some gibberish, um, so that when users try to re-download the files, um, the browser thinks it's a different URL and that effectively clears the cache. Um, so, so it does it by changing the file name and or changing the URL to the file. Um, and if you were to change the file, you saw the cache tag file to, um, so it maybe it doesn't effectively clear the file itself, but it, clear, it clears the cache of everywhere the file appears because it wants the URL to change in all of those locations. Um, sometimes people have trouble with file caching, uh, not clearing in Drupal, and that's usually because they did something custom to overwrite that natural behavior of Drupal changing file names or appending you know, a timestamp or something like that. And that's what, that's the situation we faced on the project. So three of our customers do not want to rename their files. They want to keep their file name exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a big thing with customers. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> if you, if they don't want to change the file name, they want to keep them the same, the solution generally is make sure everywhere the file gets rendered that you append a cache buster, question mark, timestamp. Right? So that way, if the file is output on the home page and the file name is never going to change, you still want to not make sure you're not breaking any of the cache bubbling, et cetera, but you want to make sure that the output of the link to the file ends in a timestamp, for example, or a, or a hash that will change every time the file changes. Um, so the file name will stay the same, but the URL to the file can be slash same old file name dot PDF question mark, you know, one, two, three, four. It just changes every time. 
Um, so that's what you would have to do to support that request. Um, there was a question me? over here. Oh, yep. Sorry, I think you, you had your hand. Oh, oh okay. okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So when you create a custom, the question was repeating for the microphone. When you create a custom module with Twig and SAS and everything else, do the same rules apply to theming? Um, yes, you can put single directory components in modules. And even if you don't put single directory components in modules, you can put a templates directory, put your Twig there. You could put a CSS file. Um, the same rules apply. So. You can create a, a library, a Drupal library, to load that CSS and JavaScript if you're not using single directory components, because single directory components does that for you. Um, yeah. So can you import a twig? You built a set twig inside of the design system, like Storybook or something, to mm -hmm. support the twig within? The question is, can you build the twig file inside of a design system like Storybook? Um, you can, there's a storybook module which provides some level of integration um, to support that. Um, is this just for a Drupal site or do you want to use it across other systems as well? Is that why you're asking that? Uh, across other systems as well, I mean, mm -hmm. ideal, you have the Twig component, but uh, yeah, I don't really want it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so across, so again, for the microphone, across other design system sharing as well as the ideal. Um, I would look into the storybook Drupal module. I think Drupal likes to own the setup. Um, so if that's okay, you can do that. Um, the code does not need to, need to really be written in a Drupal specific way, aside from that YAML file, if you choose to do single directory components, which you don't have to do. Um, you can put it into an NPM package. You would just need to make sure you're downloading it into a place that Drupal's looking for the file. Um, yeah, not a great answer. I think basically, yes, but you'd really have to sort of architect it that way. It's, it's not something that I think um, is obvious in terms of how to configure it. With that said, if somebody else has a setup like that using Storybook across multiple systems, um, feel free to chime in. I'm happy to um, hear. Do you have to adjust the mocking or attribute function in order to mm. mm -hmm. support Right, that makes sense. So, um, what he was saying uh, to contribute to the answer there is you would have to mock, did I pass the slides? Yes, I did pass them, one moment. Going back to this slide, there are certain variables that Drupal expects, such as attributes, title prefix, title suffix, and even content. The files, the Twig files you make should have those variables, and so, those variables won't automatically exist outside of a context, outside of the context of Drupal. So if you wanted to share Twig files between Drupal and other systems, you should essentially create default fallback values for those variables so that you don't get an error that says variable doesn't exist when you load them in a different design system. Any other questions from anyone? And we do have the, <coughs> um, so we have a booth, a Debug Academy booth. It's next to the Pantheon t-shirt printing station, so please come say hello. <laughs> we're, we're giving away chocolates and such. Um, and again, we do custom training online, in person. Our team is based out of the Northern Virginia area. And the Architect Series, again, is um, it's five classes. Each class is less than three hours, and we do a sort of, deep dive, cover a lot of material. We assume that the group for that course has experience with Drupal. And we do things like you know, performance, debugging, XHProf, um, and more, um, <coughs> writing maintainable code, et cetera. Um, we also do uh, consulting here and there. So if you just want us to check in on your work and 
advise and that sort of thing, we also are available for that. Um, feel free to come say hello and or scan the QR code and we'll send you that code sample. And if you check the boxes saying you're interested in hearing about the courses, um, we will also send you that information. Um, but thank you all. I hope that this was helpful.